Richard Pennyman, the golden-voiced Jim from Georgia who's better known as Little Richard, infused his performances with a flair previously unseen in the music industry. He was a trailblazer and a trendsetter, and the only thing crazier than Little Richard's impact on music is his life story. Psychoanalyst Sigmund Freud believed babies view their poop as presents they can give or withhold. At first blush, that sounds like complete nonsense, but Little Richard's childhood begs to differ. By his own admission, he used to give his excrement to people. Would you like it gift wrapped? In Charles White's The Life and Times of Little Richard, the artist admitted to having, quote, a bowel movement in a box and handing it to an elderly friend of his as a birthday present. Unaware of the horrors within, she took the box home so she could open it in front of her friends. Why Richard did such things is unclear, but his family considered him a definite abnormality. Little Richard got away with a lot as a child. According to him, that wasn't based on favoritism, but on his physical abnormalities. In The Life and Times of Little Richard, the musician told biographer Charles White, I had this great big head and a little body, and I had one big eye and one little eye. But his most defining bodily anomaly was his little leg. No, that's not a euphemism, as Richard's right leg was three inches shorter than his left, which drastically impacted his gait. His steps had an inconsistent cadence, and his hips swayed in a pronounced fashion. Since some kids are soulless insult machines, young Richard became the consistent recipient of relentless bullying, which bred a competitive streak in him and drove him to try to outdo everyone in every endeavor he could. And as one of 12 siblings, he always had someone to compete with. Little Richard Richard's little leg also introduced him to music. Richard's mother believed that sending him to church would heal his affliction. His leg never lengthened, but his lungs got lots of exercise because it was at church that Richard learned he had a hell of a voice. Home is supposed to be a haven, a place where sticks and stones won't touch your bones and words won't try to hurt you. Sadly, in Little Richard's case, home was filled with a far crueler version of the bullying he endured outside, and he was pretty constantly berated and degraded by his father, Bud Pennyman. It was just, it was just uh, like, I never could do nothing good. Like the kids outside, Bud deemed Richard too feminine. The issue wasn't his son's walk, but the budding rock star's long hair and propensity to put on makeup. His charmingly glamorous antics infuriated Bud, who was a church deacon and a firm believer in gender norms. He not only insulted his son, but rabidly attacked him. Bud viciously beat Richard, and when pulverizing his son didn't work, Bud banished him from the house altogether. Richard was just 13 years old at the time, and ultimately found acceptance with a couple named Anne and Johnny Johnson. It was a complete reversal of fortune. According to Rolling Stone, the Johnsons owned the TikTok club where Little Richard cut his teeth as a performer. After after years of being unaccepted, he finally had a chance to show the world he was exceptional. In an alternate reality, Bud Pennyman might have learned to fully accept his son. According to the life and times of Little Richard, Bud used to bash Richard's choice to be a musician, but he later had a change of heart and listened to his son's songs with pride. By then, Richard was 19 and coming into his own as a performer. He recalled, My daddy had never been behind me in my career until then, and he was just starting to come behind me. He was going to buy me a car to help me in my traveling. But Bud never got to give his son that car. In a GQ interview, Richard explained that his best friend, Frank, had only been out of jail for a week when a confrontation with Richard's father ended in death. It happened outside a bar. Frank Tanner had been tossing firecrackers into a coal stove at the Tip Inn Inn, which Bud owned. Perturbed by the juvenile hijinks, Bud eventually kicked Frank out of his establishment. Things escalated rapidly from there. Frank made a huge fuss outside, so Bud grabbed a gun and went to confront him. It's not clear exactly what happened, but Bud died. In one fell swoop, Richard lost the man who had helped give him life but also made that life a nightmare. But the scars his father left remained. Bud had rejected Richard, and Richard would also reject himself years later. In 1955, Little Richard released his first and most famous hit, Tutti Frutti. The band's upbeat sound, gibberish lyrics, and energetic wooing made it perfect for people who like feeling happily confused. However, the song wasn't always the Rudy-centric sound salad that everyone knows and loves. In fact, there was no Rudy in the original version, and it probably wasn't Daisy who almost drove Richard crazy. In what is certainly disappointing news to many preteens, Tutti Frutti wasn't an ode to farts, but the tune was about that area of the anatomy. And as the Library of Congress elaborated, the line, Tutti Frutti, ah Rudy, used to be, Tutti Frutti, good booty. 
Rolling Stone further observed that the lip-smacking celebration of good booty contained a lot of innuendos that were ultimately sanitized for marketability. But what about the tune's famous a wop bomb a loo mom a wop bomb boom Was that something lewd, like the rest of the changed lyrics? No, unfortunately. Little Richard has provided two different backstories. The utterance is either meant to reflect the drum beat, or it was something Richard angrily exclaimed during his days as a dishwasher. Whatever the case, it sounds awesome and put the perfect cherry atop a tasty euphemism sundae. Music fans weren't the only people who loved Tutti Frutti. It was also a boon for Pat Boone, who quickly recorded his own rendition. This would become a recurring theme in Little Richard's career, as other artists would duplicate his music. In the case of Tutti Frutti, Boone initially achieved greater success with his version of the song, despite it sounding less than awesome. Boone had a habit of ripping off Richard, who believed Boone benefited from racial prejudice. In 1984, he explained to the Washington Post, When Tutti Frutti came out, Elvis was immediately put on me, dancing and singing my songs on television. According to him, that resentment translated into blatant disrespect. When performing in Las Vegas, for example, he received worse accommodations than white musicians and got financially shafted. He didn't simmer in silence, however. He demanded fairer treatment. But in the end, he believed that racism robbed him of his musical legacy. During a 1999 interview with The Washington Post, Richard touted himself as the architect of rock and roll, before lamenting, if it's a white guy, they say he's the king of rock and roll. But if it's a black guy, they add self-proclaimed, they say he's the self-proclaimed king of rock and roll. Little Richard soared to incredible heights during his career, and he also got incredibly high. A lot. As the artist detailed during a Jet interview, he did drugs religiously. He had a soft spot for marijuana and PCP, but cocaine was his hands-down favorite. Richard called himself one of the biggest cocaine addicts, once telling people that blood and flesh would come out whenever he blew his nose. At one point, he was doing $1,000 worth of coke a day. He was also a hardcore voyeur and often asked girlfriends to get with other men while he watched. One of those mates was allegedly a girl named Audrey Robinson, who was 16 when they met. The story's not just pretty uncomfortable, but it's also disputed by Audrey herself. Little Richard and Jimi Hendrix have both earned spots on the Mount Rushmore of rock musicians. And in 1965, Hendrix earned a spot as a guitarist in Little Richard's band. That sounds like a recipe for greatness, but Hendrix described an awful experience driven by Little Richard's Rushmore-sized ego. Not only did Richard issue $50 fines for not calling him king, he refused to let anyone, even the supremely talented Jimi Hendrix, outshine him on stage. That rule applied to attire, hair, and even facial expressions. He once fined a musician for smiling mid-performance, and he fined Hendrix for refusing to cut his hair and at one point fired him for wearing a nice shirt. He rehired Hendrix a day later, however, after Hendrix sold the shirt. When he wasn't hassling Hendrix over his wardrobe, Richard was allegedly trying to get the guitar clothes off altogether. Rosalie Brooks, who was romantically involved with Hendrix, recalled, When I first met Jimmy, he was under so much stress from being chased by Little Richard. Richard's ravenous coke habit and lusty appetites were firmly at odds with his conservative upbringing. He grew up in a Seventh-day Adventist household in the deeply religious Deep South during the 1930s. According to Rolling Stone, both of his uncles and one of his grandfathers were preachers. His father was a deacon. The tension between the conservative religious beliefs pressed upon Richard and his wild lifestyle weighed heavily on him. His two incompatible selves were at odds, and he swung back and forth wildly between religion and the world of rock and roll. As Billboard detailed, during the mid to late 1950s, Richard rolled out hits and raked in dough. But with fame also came encounters with other men, which he deemed unnatural. So he renounced rock and roll and attended college to study theology. He couldn't suppress his attraction to men, however, and an attempt to launch a gospel career also failed. Richard went back to rock. In 1975, a family tragedy prompted him to become a preacher. He had promised to lend money to one of his brothers, but delayed the favor in lieu of a party. His brother died, and Richard never got to see him one last time. Racked with guilt, he again disavowed his rock star lifestyle. I started thinking, I started just thinking about Jesus. I started thinking about the world is going to end soon. All the trouble of the world. In 1995, he tried to reconcile his faith and identity, telling Penthouse, I've been gay all my life, and I know God is a God of love, not of hate. No matter how far or fast you run, you will never escape yourself. 
Little Richard grappled with that reality seemingly a million times during his start and stop career. According to the Washington Post, Richard's rock and roll itch returned in 1986, the year Roberta Flack inducted him into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and people started buying up his biography. But according to Richard, his decision had a much deeper motive. It wasn't about clinging to fading vestiges of fame or having one last cash grab. It was a fundamental statement about who he was. As Richard put it, rock and roll is something I created. It's all I know how to do. I don't know how to do anything else. I'm not a minister, and I'm not what you call a gospel singer, even though I've made some gospel records. I'm just an old country rock and roll singer from Macon, Georgia. According to Rolling Stone, that old rock and roll singer also pulled a few tricks out of his bag during the 1990s with several film appearances and some surprisingly catchy covers of children's songs. In fact, even as Richard continues to disavow his old self, he still wears fabulous suits and sparkly shoes. Some habits die hard, and rock and roll never dies. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more grunge videos about your favorite stuff are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.